Hello, History 103. Good to see you uh, via video at least. Uh, this is week three of class, uh, and I'm filming this on Thursday morning, September the 10th. Uh, so as you know, uh, through email I sent yesterday, there seems to have been some confusion uh, about whether or not we'd have a Zoom session yesterday. Uh, even though it was a Wednesday, which normally we would not, according to our schedule, uh, I planned on having one because, of course, Monday was Labor Day. Um, and there was confusion about that. So as you know from the email, what I've decided to do is just record a video lecture. Um, there will be a discussion response for this week and you'll get it today, Thursday. So you can watch this video uh, and then find the discussion response on Blackboard. Because our schedule is a little shifted this week, uh, what I've decided to do is make the discussion responses due by Sunday. So you have until the end of the weekend to do that. Uh, but next week, okay, uh, we'll have our normal schedule. Okay, so that means that on Monday, we'll have a Zoom meeting, with the same Zoom link that you have in the syllabus and on Blackboard. Uh, and then next Wednesday, we'll have our discussion board responses. So uh, we'll be back to the normal schedule next week. Uh, okay, so for today, uh, the topic is establishing English America, uh, New England. So we're going to look at a different region of uh, British colonization of the Americas. Of course, if you remember from last week, we discussed the Chesapeake, uh, but specifically Virginia. Uh, and just as a little bit of a recap, we discussed, and you answered in your discussion posts responses for this week, uh, how Virginia was initially founded as a private profit-making venture of the Vir Virginia Company. Uh, but over time, uh, especially after 1624, uh, it became a royal colony and a slowly growing, uh, uh, self-reproducing society. Uh, we also discussed how there were built-in uh, initial conflicts with Native Americans, talked about the example of Pocahontas, discussed Virginia as a tobacco economy, uh, and finally talked about uh, how Virginia shifted from a society, or I should say a tobacco-centered economy, uh, reliant on indentured servants to by the 1660s, 1670s, accelerated by Bacon's Rebellion, uh, and the 1680s, a society which was rooted in chattel slavery, uh, the enslavement of people from Africa, from the African continent, or people of African descent. Uh, and to begin discussing New England, uh, the, the key point that I want to make is that it was very different in uh, almost every respect from the Chesapeake. Uh, what they shared uh, was a common colonial source, meaning that Virginia was an English colony in New England, and we'll talk about Massachusetts, uh, the primary New England colony today, uh, was also an English colony. Uh, so they shared the common heritage, uh, but they could not have been more different otherwise. So today what I'm going to do is refer to the slideshow that's on Blackboard. It's the same slideshow we used last week. If you scroll down to slide nine, you'll see the title slide for what I'm going to talk about uh, today, which is establishing New England, entitled Establishing New, uh, English America, New England. Uh, and if you flip down and you can pause this and, and do this, either pull up the slideshow uh, and then get it ready to the proper slide. Um, I wanna start with slide 10. So the first full slide after the title slide establishing English America, New England. Uh, and this is uh, a way of thinking about or understanding, I should say, the religious background of uh, New England and, and Massachusetts, uh, the individual colony in particular. Uh, and if you've learned about uh, the early years of Massachusetts, but uh, in particular, for example, stories of the pilgrims, uh, you're, you're probably familiar with the fact that New England and, and Massachusetts being the first colony I was founded uh, for primarily religious reasons. Uh, so if you flip down to the slide called English Puritans, we'll just discuss that a little bit. Um, Puritan refers to the sect, uh, S-E-C-T, of uh, uh, Protestant, uh, i.e. non-Catholic Christianity, uh, which uh, rose in England before the colonization of the Americas, so in the late 16th century, before Virginia, before Massachusetts and New England, uh, who were dissenters uh, or were critics of the Anglican Church of England, which was the state-sponsored official church uh, of England. And, and actually, it is often called the Church of England. 
uh, and it still is today. Uh, there were critics for many reasons. Uh, uh, the two most important reasons were, uh, one was theological. Uh, they uh, disagreed with the religious practices and religious beliefs of the Anglican Church, uh, even though the Anglican Church was strictly and technically speaking, not a Catholic church, separate from the Catholic church. Puritans, people who identified as Puritans, who followed the theology of John Calvin, and you can see an image of him at the bottom of uh, slide number 10, uh, believe that the Anglican church was in fact too similar to the Catholic church. So it was uh, uh, elitist. Uh, the Anglican church was controlled by the British, uh, the uh, monarchy of the English Empire and its imperial bureaucracy and its uh, hereditary aristocracy. So they believe it was too hierarchical. Uh, they believe that theologically, which is its set of religious beliefs and practices, uh, that uh, the Anglican Church and its elitist leaders uh, did not care very much for the souls and the spiritual well-being of English subjects, but only maintaining their own power. Uh, they came to this belief, many of them, uh, people who came to self-identify as Puritans, through the, through the, the teachings and, and the writings of John Calvin, uh, who was born in what's today France, um, but who was a, and if you've learned about the Reformation in Europe, you're familiar with him, a major figure in the religious conflicts of the 16th century in Europe. Uh, he was a major uh, Protestant leader. Uh, who taught two concepts that Puritans would uh, take with them as they immigrated to uh, North America and founded the colonies of the region we now call New England. Uh, one of them is, as you can see, predestination and a closely related concept called the concept of the elect. Uh, so in short, what that meant was that uh, drawing from John Calvin, uh, English Puritans believed that uh, God, this is Christian God, uh, had predetermined or had predestined, <clears throat> hence the term predestination, uh, that individuals would either go to hell or be saved. Re Hell's down here. <laughs> either go to hell or be saved and reach salvation and go to heaven. Uh, and that was determined or predestined by the Christian God uh, upon their birth. Uh, this idea and the theology of John Calvin emphasized that people were inherently sinful uh, and depraved, which is a word that was commonly used in the 17th century to mean sinful. Uh, they believed that only a few people were among the Puritan elect, meaning people who were chosen, predestined to go up there, okay, to heaven, not down there. Um, and this may sound to sound like a very foreboding theology, foreboding philosophy, and, and it is in many cases to sort of modern 21st century minds. What's important for us here is that these ideas of predestination and that some would be of the elect had a direct inspiration on the physical societies that Puritans created in Massachusetts. Uh, the most important of these uh, is that Puritans again, following the theology of John Calvin, believed that uh, because the Christian God had marked some out to be the elect, predestined some to, to be the elect and predestined others to hell, um, but it wasn't truly knowable in one's lifetime that in the earthly realm, meaning during life, the best way to show your Puritan community that you were, or signal really to the Puritan community that you were one of the elect, that you were predestined to go to heaven, uh, was to strictly follow the civil and religious teachings of Puritan leaders. So what we find in English Puritan communities before immigrating to North America and afterwards is communities that were very communalistic. Uh, and I wanna be clear, not communist, but communal. Puritan communities, and you'll see this on a subsequent slide, prized strict obedience of the entire community to authorities. They discouraged individualism. But while that might sound 
before voting or very different than the way we might think of ourselves today. The flip side is that in a Puritan community, so long as one held the needs of the community above their own individual desires, Puritan communities tended to be much more democratic, at least for men in the communities. Uh, in a little while, I'll talk about the role or, or the experience of women in Puritan communities. But uh, for men, at least, uh, if you were a member in good standing of a Puritan community, you could participate formally uh, by voting and by serving in office in a way that was very restricted to only elite classes in England, in the mother country, but also restricted in a colony like Virginia. And we talked about Virginia last class. So if you flip to slide 11, we'll shift gears from this Puritan background uh, and talk about settlement in New England. And of course, this begins with the story of the pilgrims uh, and of course, the myth and the, 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 the myth of Thanksgiving and obviously Thanksgiving is a major holiday in the United States now. Um, the myth of the, uh, the pilgrims, excuse me, uh, landing at Plymouth uh, which is uh, now a town in Massachusetts and was the initial first settlement of Massachusetts. Uh, the myth about them is that they sought religious freedom. And that's probably one that you've heard uh, going all the way back, depending on, well, if you went to uh, elementary school or middle school in the United States, at least you probably heard some version of the story that the pilgrims uh, sought religious freedom. Uh, and therefore, the founding ethos, the founding mythology of at least one portion of what become the United States is that of religious freedom. Uh, it's a commonly told story. Uh, I have a question mark uh, on the phrase seeking religious freedom because it's a question that we should ask ourselves. Were they actually seeking religious freedom? The answer to that is yes and no. Uh, they sought freedom for themselves to practice their Puritan faith uh, a faith which was, for a lot of complex reasons we don't have time to go into, in England was persecuted. English authorities persecuted Puritans. And so when the so-called pilgrims in later waves, and we'll talk about that in the second bullet point on this slide, but the pilgrims in later waves of Puritan uh, migrants, when they came to New England, sought religious freedom for themselves, meaning that they sought to create a colony where they could freely practice their Puritan faith, but they did not actually intend to create a society rooted in the overall concept of religious freedom. Uh, they did not want to create a colony, for example, where anybody could come and practice their re religion freely, uh, even other Christians. It's one of the myths about New England. They actually didn't seek to create religious freedom as a concept, as a founding principle. They just wanted a space to practice for themselves. Uh, as we'll see, and I'll refer to this uh, later on today, and, and you can read some examples of this in chapters two, in chapter two in particular of America. Now, uh, Puritans were actually very discriminatory <laughs> against other Christian denominations, including Quakers. I'll talk about them next week as the founding faith of Pennsylvania. Uh, but the point about the May Mayflower Compact, uh, if we shift down a little bit, actually feeds back into the point I made just a couple of minutes ago about the ways in which Puritan faith uh, emphasized communal rather than the individual. Uh, the Mayflower Compact, uh, named after uh, the ship that the pilgrims emigrated to Plymouth on, uh, you're probably familiar with that name, uh, decided before they even disembarked the ship, before they stepped on land, uh, the male leaders decided to create what is now called the Mayflower Compact. A compact is another word for agreement, uh, but which historians now call uh, the first governing document created by colonists in North America for themselves. Uh, this Mayflower Compact is significant because all of the men on the ship uh, and later all men who would emigrate to in subsequent waves of Puritans to Massachusetts agreed that uh, they would obey, quote, just and equal laws. Uh, another way of restating that is that they agreed that the male members of the community agreed that as long as laws passed 
by Puritan authorities that would apply to Puritan Massachusetts were considered to be just and equal, all men could have a say in the governance of the colony. So this is actually democratic for its time. And when I say democratic, I don't mean to make a reference to today's Democratic Party, just to be clear. But democratic meaning widespread political participation. Uh, again, with the caveat that this only included men in New England. Uh, and as we move down to the second point on the slide entitled Settlement in New England, um, that point, uh, that, that second bullet point is just a, a quick way of noting the growth of uh, the Puritan uh, colony in Massachusetts, uh, which was especially uh, accelerated uh, by the creation of a joint stock company, similar to the Virginia Company, uh, that was called the Massachusetts Bay Company. And I say that this Massachusetts Bay Company was similar to the Virginia Company because they were both joint stock companies in which investors pooled their money. Uh, the difference with the Massachusetts Bay Company is that unlike the Virginia Company, the Massachusetts Bay Company was not primarily concerned with making profit. They were primarily concerned with allowing Puritan migrants the means to move to New England. So rather than being a strictly profit-making venture, it was seen as a vehicle to promote the immigration of Puritans to this new colony across the Atlantic Ocean uh, in Massachusetts. And by the way, if you're not familiar, Massachusetts is the name of a Native American tribe that lived in the region before European settlement. So the English Puritans picked that name, picked up that name and applied it to the colony that they created. Uh, Ed, and you have a statistic there. Uh, between 1629, uh, when the Massachusetts Bay Company was founded in London by Puritan investors uh, until 1643, so over a 15-year period, uh, a, a period that's called the Great Migration, uh, about 21,000 Puritans uh, came to Massachusetts Bay. Um, overall, about 25,000 people total went to Massachusetts Bay. Uh, so that meant that 4,000 weren't Puritans, but that a much larger number were. Um, and unlike the Chesapeake, getting down to the very last point, and, and this is a very important point for understanding the differences between New England and Virginia, uh, from the very beginning of its settlement, and because of its Puritan origins and because of Puritan communities' emphasis on communal rather than the individual, we see from the very earliest passenger lists, beginning with the pilgrims themselves in the autumn of 1620, uh, far more uh, intact families emigrated to Massachusetts from the earliest settlement. If we remember when uh, you looked at the Jamestown uh, initial passenger list for your uh, first discussion board response, you all noted correctly uh, that it was entirely men uh, and that the occupations of the initial passengers suggested that they were business minded. Uh, it's very much the opposite in Massachusetts as more colonies. Uh, and for reasons I'll talk about on a couple of subsequent slides, a far fewer indentured servants came to Massachusetts from its earliest settlement. Uh, the simple fact about uh, a settlement in New England beginning with Massachusetts is that uh, the labor force uh, was the family itself rather than as was the case in Virginia, where tobacco planters utilize the labor force of indentured servants and eventually slaves held in bondage. Uh, the opposite was true of Massachusetts from the very beginning of its settlement. Uh, so now I wanna just flip down to slide number 12, uh, which is called New England Society. So on this slide, we'll see some further aspects of the ways in which uh, Puritanism uh, as a theology, a set of religious beliefs uh, influenced uh, the construction of society in Massachusetts and eventually throughout all of the region that we now call New England. Uh, and I want to start here by talking about, as I alluded to earlier, uh, the family structure and gender relations in, in early New England. And, and again, they're quite different than as was the case in Virginia. Uh, so as I noted in Virginia, uh, because of the unnatural gender ratios, meaning that there were three to four women, or men 
for every single woman. We see women, as we noted last class, with more economic independence because of the frequent cycles of birth or uh, death and remarriage, death of spouses and remarriage uh, to new spouses. We see women gain more economic independence. Uh, in Puritan New England, beginning with Massachusetts, we see a much more traditional model, meaning a model much more similar to the mother country in England. Um, there is zero doubt that New England society was uh, a patriarchy, uh, meaning that it was a male-dominated but family structure. When we look at the, at the level of individual families, uh, it was also a patriarchy uh, throughout all levels of government and in the Puritan church. Uh, in New England, uh, as was the case in uh, England itself, uh, and as was less so the case in Virginia, uh, women lived under a legal system of oppression that it was called coverture, uh, as in England, as you can see on the slide. Uh, that's a legal term that describes uh, women's legal subordination to a man uh, at every step of her life. Uh, and that term literally means that women were covered and this is legally speaking, covered uh, by a male presence. So that uh, under, uh, in Massachusetts uh, and, and in England as well, uh, women uh, did not have uh, anything close to the same legal rights that men did. And in fact, uh, women before they were married and after their marriage were uh, and could be legally uh, represented by a man. Uh, another way of putting that is that women did not have a separate legal existence apart from a man. So uh, before marriage, that would be to a woman's girl and woman's uh, father or uh, a male a member of the family, an uncle, if their father had died, or perhaps an older brother. Um, and then after marriage, a woman uh, was legally subordinated to her husband. And this would lead to, we'll see uh, on a subsequent slide, uh, some very interesting gender dynamics in New England, but also some women speaking out against this patriarchy. Uh, and the most uh, important example we'll see in a little bit is the case of Anne Hutchinson. So I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, but this patriarchal vision, um, coverture is the legal term that describes legal patriarchy. Uh, we also see expressed in uh, the way in which church and government closely intertwined in Massachusetts. So unlike today, as per the United States Constitution, there is technically a legal separation between the church and state, uh, as per the First Amendment of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Uh, in early New England and Massachusetts, there was, uh, in effect, no separation between the church, the Puritan church, and the state, or the governments of Massachusetts. And we see Puritan patriarchy and communal ideas come together in the convergence of the church and state in early Massachusetts. And the clearest example of this is, is a, uh, a fear, you could say a paranoia that early New England leaders had about excessive individualism. Uh, and excessive, excessive individualism could take many different forms. It could be uh, through individual behaviors, uh, any kind of behavior that suggested that a person uh, held themselves apart from the community uh, was punished by Massachusetts authorities. Um, that could take the form of dress. <coughs> it often took the form of sexual relations, so what were considered to be deviant. Uh, sexual relations were heavily punished in uh, early New England. Uh, that could take the form of religion, and we'll talk about that on the next slide when we discuss uh, the case of Anne Hutchinson. So religious criticisms, uh, theological criticisms of Puritan leaders were heavily cracked down upon. Uh, and it was also on a philosophical level as well, which gets to this uh, natural versus civil liberty distinction that you can see on the screen. Uh, this uh, distinction was one that was made by the earliest uh, powerful leader of uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, a man named John Winthrop. And you should be able to scroll down and see an image of John Winthrop, a very stern looking man with a black coat and a white collar. Uh, he was uh, 
the an early governor uh, of the colony of Massachusetts Bay. Uh, he'd, he'd helped to found the Massachusetts Bay Company. Uh, and as early Massachusetts Bay's most powerful leader, John Winthrop articulated the difference between natural and civil liberty for members of the Massachusetts Puritan community, which really reflects this uh, patriarchal and communal society and the ways in which church and government, uh, again, were closely intertwined uh, in this society. Uh, so John Winthrop, in a speech he gave to the Massachusetts General Court, and you can see that term, and I'll talk about that in a second, but uh, quickly, the general court was the lawmaking body for the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which was created in 1634. Um, it's confusingly called a court, although we usually associate today courts with uh, legal tribunals. Uh, in early Massachusetts, it was the lawmaking body. Uh, but in a speech to this general court, and, and this is from the year 1644, if I remember correctly, uh, John Winthrop uh, argued that there are basically two kinds of liberty or freedom, it's the word that we would use today, that exist in the world. Uh, one, uh, which he spoke of negatively, uh, he called natural freedom. And this natural freedom, uh, according to John Winthrop, uh, was uh, the kind of freedom that both human beings and animals shared, uh, by which he meant that uh, natural freedom is a natural liberty to do whatever an individual wants. Uh, and he thought about this in terms of the philosophical construct of the state of nature. Uh, perhaps you're familiar with this, but it's the idea that before there were governments in a pre-recorded time in human history, before people came together to form governments, uh, all beings lived in a state of natural liberty. Uh, people, individuals just did whatever they want. Uh, whatever they could to survive, they had no responsibility to a higher authority. And he was very critical of this. He says that, again, to paraphrase, uh, this kind of liberty, natural liberty, uh, is uh, wrong because it's unsophisticated. It's a freedom, a liberty that humans and animals share in a state of nature where there is no government. Humans and animals will just do whatever they can to survive. And he's negative about this. He says, this is not the kind of liberty we want to promote here in Massachusetts. Uh, and he associated this for his audiences with individualism. People who are individualistic are acting on the impulses of natural liberty. The good kind of liberty, according to John Winthrop, was called civil liberty. And what he meant by this was uh, a fascinating concept in which he, he argued that uh, a person, an individual, uh, or a community itself is not actually free unless it is subjected to the authority of a higher power. So to restate that, a community or a person within that community can never reach a true state of freedom without being subjected to a higher power. And the example he used in this speech ties back into uh, Puritan concepts of gender. Uh, and the example he used was marriage. Uh, he said, uh, and this is paraphrasing, I won't subject you to the 17th century writing, uh, but he said, uh, in short, that a woman is free to choose whatever man she wants to choose to be her husband. But once she's chosen that man, she cannot be truly free until she is subjected to his authority. So that a woman is not actually free they can't experience liberty unless they are subjected to the authority of their husband. So for him, women weren't free unless they were married and were subjected, again, subject to their husband's authority. And then he extended that metaphor a little bit farther. He said, just like a woman is not free unless she is married and, and obedient to her husband, all of us, Puritans are not free unless we subject ourselves to the authority of God. And again, the Christian God. So I think that example really says a lot about the way that uh, early leaders in Massachusetts and, and uh, conceived of society. Uh, and it says a lot uh, about the way that, again, Puritan theology informed the foundation of Massachusetts. Uh, the last two points I, I want to talk about, they, they, they 
are the practical manifestations of these ideas uh, and the combination of church and government uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, the first I referred to a little while ago uh, was the creation of the General Court in 1634, uh, the first lawmaking body for the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, and it was, uh, for its time, a democratic institution in that it was elected by all free men, uh, which was not just a descriptive term, but actually a legal status. A free man meant a man uh, who was a landowner, independent on his own, meaning that he was not a servant to another man, uh, nor was he still under the authority of his father. So in practice, what that meant was free men were heads of households who had their own families. Uh, and this was democratic because uh, this describes uh, a large number of men in Massachusetts. Uh, in 1641, what we see this general court issue is a remarkable document called the Body of Liberties. Uh, this is, uh, it's useful to think of this Body of Liberties as the, the, a very, 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 very urgent, uh, early version, urgent is not the word, early version uh, of the American Bill of Rights, which we'll talk about the first of 10 amendments to the Constitution, and we'll get to that uh, in about six weeks. This is remarkable because Again, for as much as Puritan theology and the ways it was expressed in Puritan government and society can seem very uh, dark and foreboding to 21st century Americans, as I've suggested several times, the flip side uh, is that it, as long as one subjected themselves and accepted the authority of the church and the government in Massachusetts, they actually, in the body of liberties, in a way that was not the case in Virginia or even in England itself, could rely upon a specific list of rights that was protected by the Massachusetts government. Uh, this is called the Body of Liberties, and it's a an numbered list from 1 to 101. Uh, 101 different rights that different groups of people had in Massachusetts, and it was broken up by different demographics. So the first section and the longest section is the rights of freemen. Uh, and this is an extensive section that lists all of the different rights that freemen have, rights that the Massachusetts Bay government, uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony government could not violate. But it's also broken up further than that. Uh, there were uh, freedoms for women uh, and there are three specific freedoms for women that are uh, specific to, the, to, to women as a gender um, that are remarkable for their time. Uh, explicit protections for women that you would never see in England or never see in Virginia. Uh, and one of them, and I'll just bring up one, uh, is very modern in many ways. Um, it's a protection against what today we would call domestic abuse, basically. Uh, and to paraphrase it, it said that if a woman uh, had cause to be corrected, which means uh, that's a 17th century word for physically punished, uh, because she disobeyed her husband, the husband could not actually apply that punishment himself. Uh, if a husband thought that his wife needed to be corrected, uh, what he had to do by law was go to the local authority who would then hear the case of each side of the husband and the wife, uh, and then decide if the wife should be punished, or if the husband was making up these charges and should face punishment himself. So again, a very modern protection uh, against uh, domestic abuse. Uh, there's a section further in the body of liberties called the liberties of foreigners and strangers, people who would emigrate to Massachusetts who were not Puritans and not English, so foreigners and strangers. And in this section, actually, there's a reference to slavery. Uh, in 1641, there were a handful of slaves, people of African descent, who were enslaved in Massachusetts, less than 20, so uh, an almost non-existent number. Uh, but in this section, the section of for foreigners, uh, the liberties of foreigners and strangers, uh, there is a reference to it. Uh, and again, to paraphrase, it says that we will not encourage slavery in our colony as a general rule unless a slave is sold to us from outside Massachusetts. So that's a loophole. And unless somebody is sold to us as a foreign slave or 
if we take slaves as captives in a war. Uh, and that's a reference, and we'll see this in a little bit, to ongoing conflict between Native Americans and Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, Massachusetts Bay colonists. But in general, Massachusetts Bay said we would prefer slavery to not become an important institution, with some exceptions. So uh, having said that, I'm now going to scroll down to uh, the last couple of slides. And, and again, you can take a look at the picture of John Winthrop. Uh, and I want to talk about um, slide number 14, and then one after John Winthrop's uh, portrait, uh, which is New England Divided. Uh, so this slide uh, gets us to begin recognizing that for as much as people like John Winthrop argue that there should be communalism, that individualism should be discouraged, then for as much as Massachusetts Bay authorities and the general court and the bodies of liberties attempted to provide rights for members of the community, uh, we still see from the early stages by the 1630s and 40s challenges to the authority of Massachusetts Bay government and church that show that this vision, what early Massachusetts Bay colonists called Massachusetts being a city upon a hill, a shining beacon of morality back to depraved England that emphasized communalism, uh, we see from the earliest stages challenges to this. Uh, and the first point is a restatement uh, of the Puritan uh, views of freedom and individualism, right? That one can't be free unless you're a part of a community and subjected to authority. And this view in the minds of people like John Winthrop meant that any kind of dissent or criticism would not be tolerated. And we see this in two particular cases. We see first in the case of Roger Williams, a man uh, who emigrated, uh, an early colonist who emigrated to Massachusetts Bay in the early 1630s during the so-called Great Migration, uh, came to Massachusetts and he himself was a Puritan, uh, but very quickly became dissatisfied with what he found. Uh, he found that uh, men like John Winthrop, because they had combined the authority of the church and the state, uh, according to Roger Williams, they had accrued far too much power, far too much individual power. And Roger Williams began to argue that the church, the Puritan church and its authorities should be legally separated from the state government authorities. And that was the best way to protect individual liberties, not combining the church and the state. He viewed the combination of the church and the state as a potentially tyrannical con uh, uh, combination. So he began to make this point publicly. Uh, he began to criticize John Winthrop, the governor of Massachusetts Bay, for his close ties to the leaders of the Puritan church in Massachusetts. Uh, and eventually he was put on trial uh, for sedition, which is uh, a legal term for treason. So by arguing that you could separate, that you should separate the church and the state in early Massachusetts, you could be charged with treason. And Roger Williams was. Uh, after several court cases, uh, he eventually was expelled from the colony, uh, where he and his followers migrated to the south from Boston, where they founded the colony of Rhode Island. It's now the state of Rhode Island, uh, a colony they founded in 1637. Uh, that actually provided for true religious freedom. Uh, Rhode Island was founded as a colony in which people from all different kinds of Christian denominations could emigrate and practice their religion uh, without fear of being persecuted by Puritans. Again, remembering Puritans themselves were persecuted in England and Massachusetts Bay. They themselves were the persecutors. Uh, another, and I think in many ways, more significant challenge uh, to the authority of Puritan leaders was the case of Anne Hutchinson and her challenge to the church authority, the very last point that you see there. Uh, and, and her challenge to church authority was more dangerous from the perspective of somebody like John Winthrop uh, than that of Roger Williams for two reasons. Uh, one, her gender, because she was a woman. And as we've discussed, Massachusetts is a very patriarchal society. And two, because she preached a concept called antinomianism, that term that you can see in the quotations. Uh, so because of her religious beliefs and her gender, 
Anne Hutchinson was a uh, even more dangerous figure to Massachusetts authorities. So Anne Hutchinson uh, was also an early immigrant to, to Massachusetts. She came with her husband and uh, several of her 12 children, uh, some of whom remained in England. Uh, and Anne Hutchinson, uh, similar to Roger Williams, actually, uh, upon arriving in Boston, uh, the town, now uh, the city of Boston, uh, quickly became disenchanted with, uh, similar to Roger Williams, uh, what she found, which was that uh, the male authorities of the state and the church, again, combined into one, uh, were, she believed, using their power in tyrannical ways as tyrants. Uh, and she took it one step further. Uh, she began to actually hold meeting meetings in her home, religious meetings in her home, uh, a big violation of Puritan authorities. Uh, she began to hold these meetings in her home uh, in which she began to preach a concept called antinomianism. Uh, and antinomianism is a term that describes uh, it can be used in any world religion. Here we're talking about it in the context of Puritan Christianity, but uh, you can be an antinomian uh, in uh, uh, Islam, for example, or in any other world religion. Antinomianism is a concept which essentially states that an individual can reach salvation, whatever form heaven takes, without needing the assistance of ministers. That's what antinomianism means. It's an anti-authoritarian religious belief. I don't need ministers to help me reach heaven. I can do that on my own. And this is what Anne Hutchinson began to, to preach. She began to argue that we don't need the Puritan ministers here in Massachusetts. And most importantly, we don't need to blindly obey Puritan ministers in Massachusetts to show that we are a part of the elect to go back to that earlier term, we can actually connect with, in this case, the Christian God individually. We don't need the quote unquote middleman to use a colloquial phrase to help us reach salvation. We can do it ourselves. And this is what antinomianism is. So she preached anti-authoritarian message. We don't need the ministers. And she was a woman. By the way, this concept that it, we as individuals can reach salvation through an individual connection through prayer with the Christian God was called a belief in inner grace, that everybody has an inner grace within them that they can access. You don't need, again, a minister to do that for you. Uh, and these beliefs, uh, belief in antinomianism uh, and her gender, uh, brought her into significant trouble. Uh, she was put on trial, like Roger Williams was, was uh, for sedition. Actually, about at the same time. So these cases are happening roughly at, in the years 1635, 1636, and 1637. And in this trial, uh, she was grilled by the two highest-ranking civil authorities in Massachusetts. One, the governor, John Winthrop, the other, his lieutenant governor, the second in command named Thomas Dudley. These two men, two highest authorities, civil authorities in Massachusetts, uh, question her extensively over the course of several days. Uh, and in this questioning, she actually refused to admit that she'd done anything wrong. Uh, repeatedly, she said, I don't believe that I've done anything wrong in preaching antinomianism. And this infuriated them so much that she was ex uh, expelled herself in 1637. Uh, she was forced to leave Massachusetts. Actually, she was forced by soldiers in a big public ceremony. She was stripped of all of her possessions and escorted out of the colony of Massachusetts by soldiers. She eventually actually settled in Westchester, which is north of New York City. Uh, but so if you're familiar actually with the uh, Hutchinson Parkway, that's it's named after her. Uh, but these two cases, the case of Roger Williams, the case of Anne Hutchinson, uh, uh, are evidence, right, that this vision that early Massachusetts leaders had uh, began to crumble. So their vision for what they called a godly utopia of Puritanism, the city upon a hill, 
uh, as great as it was in theory in practice crumbled. So I want to just wrap up this uh, PowerPoint slide by talking about the New England economy. Uh, okay, thought there was a tech problem. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, just just FYI, is is not to talk about Puritans and Indians. The very last slide today. Uh, just for purposes of time, I don't want this video to go on too long, but we will discuss that. And I know there was a question that I received about uh, what exactly King Philip's War was. Uh, I'm going to leave that question uh, until next week, and I'll get to it. I just don't want to have this video go on forever. Uh, but the New England economy, our last slide, uh, again, is a, is a point of departure from Virginia. Um, and uh, as I said, with reference to uh, the Puritan family and gender and uh the relationship between church and government in Massachusetts, the New England economy reflected the, the Puritan origins uh, of the colony. Uh, the settlement and land patterns uh, were extremely different from those in Virginia from a very early stage. Um, you can flip back and forth between this text, the slide called New England economy and the map that's below it. Uh, well, not a map actually, a, a plan of a town, a generalized plan of a town uh, to begin thinking about the differences uh, between Virginia and Massachusetts. Uh, so unlike Virginia, in which there was uh, a very small number of elites who owned uh, massive amounts of land uh, and in which settlement was spread out, very few towns in Virginia, uh, the opposite was true of Puritan Massachusetts. Puritans settled in compact, town-oriented settlement patterns, uh, and that uh, image on slide 16 uh, shows you that. You can see a generalized plan for the town, for a New England town, uh, which is centered on a church and a town, uh, I'm sorry, a church and, a, and a, a town meeting house, which you can see if you look at that map closely. Clustered around that center are individual homes. And if you look at those lots, each size is roughly the same. In early Massachusetts, uh, land distribution was relatively equal, unlike in Virginia, where a very small number of people owned a huge amount of land. The opposite was true uh, in early Massachusetts. Uh, and the agriculture, the economy of early Massachusetts was primarily subsistence agriculture uh, using family labor. Uh, unlike in Virginia, which as we've discussed very early on became a tobacco colony. So its economy was rooted in producing one commodity crop that would be sold to Europe. Uh, the opposite was true of New England. Uh, subsistence agriculture using primarily family labor was the center of the economy. Um, that meant that there was very little need for servants or slaves early on. Uh, over time, what we begin to see is that New England would become a commercial region, meaning that uh, trade uh, and extracting commodities to trade would over time, over the course of the 1700, uh, 16 and 1700s become the center uh, of the New England economy. Uh, and the earliest trade commodities, in addition to subsistence agriculture, were fish that were caught in the North Atlantic Sea and lumber, which was uh, uh, extracted from forests in New England. Uh, slowly over time, and this is a subject I'll return to, we begin to see New England become a powerful region in the trading networks of the Atlantic. So New Englanders conducted significant amounts of trade between England, the mother country, uh, over time, and also trade between New England and the Caribbean. Uh, eventually, New England traders began to conduct trade with African nations, or, or African kingdoms, I should say. Uh, and this included the African slave trade, uh, which is a subject I'll talk about uh, very soon. Uh, but I'm going to go and stop there. I don't want this video to go on for too long. Uh, so as I said, um, you'll see a discussion board uh, response from me today, uh, and you can respond to it by Sunday. Uh, okay. Uh, I will see you all next Monday. All right. Thanks.